How's it going tonight, y'all? Um, so to kind of start uh, with this, I was born at a very young age, so I had to throw that out there. Uh, but <laughs> had to. So, uh, but my story with you know dealing with suicidal thoughts and everything really starts when I was four, and when I was young enough to really remember anything. I grew up with an older sister by about 10 months, and then I found out when I was four that I was going to get a little brother, and so that immediately threw me into middle child territory, and for those of you that are in this room that are middle child, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but so, gr growing up, I was just, I always fought for the affirmation of my parents, and just trying to get their attention, and just trying to hear, like, you're doing a great job, or... Like, I'm so proud of you, like stuff like that. Even if it was for like, you know, coloring in the lines, I was like, hey, if I can do that, I'm doing great. But um, as soon as my brother came along, it started to become a fight for affirmation. And when I didn't get that, um, I went to school and I tried to get that for my classmates. And in doing so, I kind of put myself at the mercy of those kids. Um, because the one word that I wanted to be more than anything in this life when I was a kid was popular. Because if, if I was popular, I made it. I, if I was in school and I was called popular, I made it. And that was, I was misguided in that. But I left myself at the mercy of those kids. And instead of them accepting me and, you know, loving me for who I am, they bullied me. They, because if they said jump, I was like, how high? And so sixth grade is really when that kind of seeped in for the first time. Because I would go home. And I, was, I would be crying my eyes out wondering, why, why can't I fit in? Why are they doing this? Why are they all just so mean to me and everything? And so uh, and at that time, my parents started having issues in their marriage. And so when I was trying to go seek affirmation from them and guidance from them, I, I wasn't getting it because they were frustrated with their own selves or just trying to handle everything. And my sister and brother didn't know any better. And so I had no one to go to. And so sticking in isolation, that's where I found, you know, found myself getting deeper and deeper into those pits. Um, for those of you that know music, I would listen to bands like Three Days Grace, 30 Seconds to Mars, Linkin Park, and that would be my escape. But it would only be a temporary escape. And so middle of seventh grade year is when the first time that thought popped into my head. It's like, what if you weren't here? What if you didn't exist anymore? What if you just left and you were gone? And it, I started buying into the lies of I don't matter and that my life isn't worth anything. And so I started kind of figuring out, like, how could I do it? I started, like, kind of formulating that in my mind, and it was a dark place that I hit, like, I hit. And it would be just any instance that I found in school that somebody said something, I was like, what if I wasn't here? How would they feel? And I was, my, I had convinced myself, if I had done that, if I had taken my own life, that those people would be like, you know, they don't have a care in the world. They'd actually be happy. And so it kind of it kept going and going, and it, it was all really talk and just like me kind of like talking myself up into it until I got to about ninth grade, and this is where everything kind of had a seismic <coughs> shift. And that's when my parents finally got a divorce after it kind of building and building. So my mom was my rock, and when I, would try, when I was able to go for, to her for things, she, was, she would always give me like what I needed, great, like great answers, and she would try... I, she would try to help me understand things and why I was being bullied. I never revealed to her that I was dealing with suicide. Like, my parents didn't know until a couple years ago when I kind of made it public. Um, but so, ninth grade year, it was one afternoon I came home from school, and my mom's side of the bedroom, all her stuff's gone, her closet emptied out. She just up and left. And so, she was gone. Um, my little brother at the time, he was very young. And so, I, I, I was alone still. And I finally had lost the person that I knew I could go to. And that, that just changed everything. So it was actually one day at school in uh, 2009, October 23rd. Um, I had just had enough, really. I, I felt like I was just spinning the tires continuously. I felt like, because I, I was on athletic teams and I still wasn't getting any respect or love or like, you know, because I, I was still seeking that affirmation from those other people, from my coaches, from my teammates, from my classmates. And every single time it was like a wall came up. And so um, I came home from school and I decided that's it. Finally <coughs> decided that's enough. Uh, I went down into my garage, pulled out a basketball net and tied it to my fan and got up there, kicked the chair, had all the intention of ending my life. And after about two or three seconds, the net broke off the fan and I fell to the floor. And something that Dr. Ford mentioned on the radio the other day is that 
as soon as I kicked that chair, I immediately regretted that decision. And she, in most suicide cases, that is the case. As soon as they, like, they start to jump or something happens, they immediately are like, why am I doing this? You get to that point. But still getting to that point psychologically, mentally, is, is such a dark place to be. But I, I never got back up and tried again. And that's something that, in hindsight, because what I did not tell you throughout all this time, throughout all of my childhood, I was not raised in a Christian home. So I, I didn't have like, the knowledge that I was worth everything to God. That God sent his only son to die for me on the cross. I didn't, wake, I didn't grow up with that. And so when I finally found that two years later, that changed everything. And if there is something I want you guys to take away from that, is that is a relationship with Jesus and knowing firmly where your worth is found in every single sense of the word because he calls you loved and valued and capable and worthy because he knows the hairs on each and every single one of your heads. And I didn't know that my entire life until I was 16. And when that, that's when the light clicked. And that's when I realized in hindsight, when I looked back on that, like, why did the net break? Why did I never get up and try again? It was him working in my life before I even came to know who he was. Because he is provider, he is protector, he is healer. And so I've also, uh, with the, the bracelet, a couple years ago, my friend Mark, um, man, uh, we grew up together all throughout grade school. He's one of the goofiest guys I've ever met. He once ordered four separate entrees from Applebee's, and the guy who was taking the order was like, okay, this guy means business. So uh, one night in December, about four years ago, I got a call from Mark, and he was just like, dude, like, what am I doing? I'm like, I don't know what you're doing. Can you tell me what you're doing? Because like, he's just, and he just ultimately ended up, he was like, I don't have a reason to live anymore. And... I tried to, you know, introduce Christ into his life, but he wasn't, he wasn't taking it. And then about six weeks later, I got the call that Mark had uh, actually taken his own life. Um, and so that's another, if you guys have any friends or family that have ever lost, like, had taken their life via suicide, I know it's hard. It's very hard, and I still think about that every day. But um, if there's anything you can say to them, it's definitely if you're a believer, introduce them to who Christ is and how much he loves them. Because whether they know it or not, because I didn't know it at the time when I was 14. I didn't know I was a creation of God. But I came to know that. And some people, there's a lot of people in this world that don't know that, but a lot of you in this room are going out there to mission fields all over the place, even in your own dorms, in your own apartments and condos right now, like carrying that name, carrying that mission. And so, but I would also like remind them that you're there, that they do matter to you. Show them that love that surpasses every other kind of love, and that's Christ-like love. Because that, in the end, will hold. It's never going to fail. It's never going to run out. And you guys have an abundance of it because you're all vessels for change in this world. And if you're going through something right now, I know a lot of us in this room have papers and quizzes and all this other stuff that we got every single day. Ladies in the back, soccer practice, y'all are killing it. But I know that so you trying to juggle all that can be hard sometimes, and I'm going to hold this down now. But if there's anything I can remind you of, it's that you do matter. No matter what the enemy tries to get you to believe in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, you are a creation of God, first and foremost. You're a child of God. You are loved beyond compare. And there's nothing that the enemy can do that can ever take that away. And that is something you can always remind your friends and remind your family of, but also that they're not just loved by God, that they're loved by you. Because there are complete strangers in this world that don't feel like they have worth every single day. There's somebody that could be you pass at the Walmart, because everybody goes there. <coughs> if somebody you pass at the Walmart could be having a, like a rough day. One of the employees, somebody you pass, and a one small thing, one small compliment about their shirt or their hair, or maybe their mustaches in a really awesome like braided way. I don't know. I've seen it before. But every little thing matters, and it can switch. It can... It, Anything you say that can build someone up can change someone's life and pull them farther and farther away from the edge. So I implore you to reach out, take bold steps in the middle of that because those in the end, that can save lives, y'all. Y'all are all world changers in this room because God has called you that. And you all matter, you're all vital to not just the growth of this campus, not just the growth of your counties and your homes, but think about this, how 
Everybody in this room, I don't know how many of you have known one another. If you've known each other for years, that may be different. But <coughs> three years ago, I didn't know any of you, let alone some of you I don't even know now. But here's the thing. We are all united in one cause for Christ, and we all have a life that we're supposed to glorify him in. And there's going to be people that you've never met five years, ten years, twenty years down the road that could be struggling with that, that could be struggling with self-doubt, self-worth, everything. And you are going to be the spark that pulls them away from the edge. Your love and your kindness and your words could bring them back to what, not only an understanding of how precious life is, but also how precious the Lord made them. And so that's what I'll leave you with tonight, is that you're loved, you are valued, and I implore you guys to continue pressing on in your fields and everything, showing that love and reminding people how much they matter so we can continue to take that number that is certainly there right now and continue to reduce it down and down and down. And remember how life matters, how precious people are. Thank you so much. Uh, my husband Michael and I were missionaries with the North American Mission Board. And on the outside, it looked like life was great. Everybody thought we had it all together. We had the perfect life. But what many didn't know was that Michael was struggling with bipolar disorder. And if you don't know about bipolar disorder, it's a disorder where you have extreme depression and then you have mania, which sends you into a high, almost like you're on drugs, but you're not on drugs. Your body is naturally taking you there. And the higher the high, the lower the low. And so our lives were a constant roller coaster. But because we were in ministry, we didn't want to tell anybody because we were supposed to have it together, right? I mean, if you're a missionary, you're supposed to have it together. And so we couldn't tell anybody what was going on. And so we struggled in silence and we didn't tell anybody for a long long time about our, our journey and our struggles and Michael really believed that God was somehow punishing him for sin in his life when he did finally confide in a, a Christian this person meant really well and they said well you know you must have sin in your life because if you were living right you know the Bible says be joyful always you wouldn't be struggling with depression you're a Christian you know if you're struggling with depression it's sin so he would stay up all night long night after night praying and confessing his sins to the Lord begging God to forgive him and he would wake up the next morning and he would still feel bad and maybe not just bad maybe even worse if you can imagine and so then we had other well-meaning Christians who said, well, you know what? You just don't have enough faith because if you had faith, then God would heal you from this. So this is a faith issue. So then he went on this journey of begging God, please, Lord, give me enough faith. Heal me from this. And in the midst of these highs and lows, I really felt like the Lord pressed upon my heart about Paul. You know, Paul had a thorn in his flesh and he pleaded with God three times, take this thorn from me. And what did God say to him in response? What did he say? My grace is sufficient. And I felt like that's what God was telling me, that this bipolar is a thorn in the flesh that I'm not going to remove. It's not due to sin. It's not a lack of faith. It's something I'm allowing to make you dependent on me. <coughs> And so we had these, this roller coaster of a life. And one, one weekend, we were hosting a conference, and we had people coming in from all over the southeast to learn about how to do ministry, and we were hosting this. And, uh, and Michael had been doing well, and um, he had not slept good for a couple of nights. And so this is the night before the conference. And he said, you know, I think I'm going to go home and take a nap. And I said, that's fine. I'll just I'll finish up and get everything ready for tomorrow. And so that... I finished up everything and I was driving to the gym and you know how the Holy Spirit sometimes just that still small voice speaks to your spirit I just sensed the Lord saying go home and I was like but I'm already halfway to the gym and I just heard go home so I turned the car around and I drove home and I found Michael asleep on the bed and I couldn't wake him and there was an empty bottle of Ambien beside the bed so I immediately called 911 and we got him to the hospital and praise God, we got there in time. They were able to pump his stomach and save his life. But now our secret was out. He was in the hospital. He was supposed to be leading this conference the next day, and now we weren't there. And so 
So people, our, we, our secret was out. And that led to Michael being hospitalized for, for several months to get care. By this time, we had a four-year-old, we had a little daughter. She was about three at the time. And, um, and so I would just tell her, dad's traveling, he's away. Because you, how do you tell a three-year-old your dad overdosed? And so after months of going through um, hospitalizations, inpatient and then outpatient, he finally came home. And for the first time in years, he was stable and he was healthy and he was well. And I thought, man, am I glad this is over. Because the thing is about bipolar disorder is there are medications to control the disorder to help the person to be themselves. But part of the illness is coming off the medication. Because, see, Michael kept thinking when he would get well, he'd take his medicine, he would get well, and he'd say, oh, well, God healed me. I don't need it. I mean, who wants to take medicine when you feel good? But it's very similar to a diabetic. You take insulin to control the diabetes, and you feel better. So every time he would come off his medication, the cycle would begin again. Well, so he'd come home from the hospital. The medications are stable. Life is good. So I go to this little conference. Some of you may have heard of it called Passion. And I uh, took a few students, and while we were there, Francis Chan was preaching, and he spoke on um, when life hurts. And he asked the question, he said, how many of you in this room want to be like Jesus? So I'm going to ask you, raise your hand if you're in this room and you want to be like Jesus. Okay, you can put your hands down. What if the Lord said, the only way I can make you look more like Jesus is to bring suffering into your life? Now, how many of you want to be more like Jesus? And that's what Francis Chan asked. And I thought, whoa, Lord, I want to be like you. But the last several years have been a roller coaster of hurts and pains and heartache. And I don't want to go back to that. Praise God, that's behind me. And I don't know anything else Francis Chan said that night because that kept rolling in my head. You know, it was almost like in the Bible when uh, God said, Peter, do you love me? Or Jesus says, Peter, no, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? But I, I kept hearing the Holy Spirit saying, Natalie, do you trust me? Natalie, do you trust me? And I wrestled with the Lord. And long after the session was over, I was on my knees before God wrestling, saying, you know, Lord, I, I, I trust you, but I don't want to hurt. And he's like, no buts. Do you trust me? Yeah, but. And after this long wrestling match with the Lord, I finally just surrendered and said, okay, God, I trust you. And I got up off my knees and I told a couple of people who were with me at the conference and they said, you need to call Michael and you need to tell him what God has just done in your life. So I called, and the moment he answered the phone, I could hear the depression in his voice. I knew that he was back in the pit. And I said, Michael, are you taking your medication? And he said, no, I was doing so well. I just knew God had healed me, and I was going to surprise you and show you, but I'm not well. So that started us back on a journey, back to the doctors to get back on medication. And the, the, the sad thing about this is the medications don't work like a Tylenol. They don't work immediately. They take weeks to get into your system to start showing improvement. So Michael went to the doctor. He started back on medication. And then the following Sunday, our church had a share time for the students to talk about passion. And at the end, I stood before them, and I said to them, to my church family, I said, you know, I told them about my experience and what I felt like God was saying. And I said, I don't know what this week holds. But I know three things. I know God is a good God. I know He's on the throne. And I know I can trust Him. I said that on Sunday. On Friday, Michael took his life and he died. I had no idea what God was preparing me for. And so many people in our lives were shocked and taken aback because we kept it hidden. We kept it a secret. We didn't talk about it. If we had shared our story, there may have been other people to come alongside us, and we might have had a different ending, but we didn't. And, you know, Kyle mentioned the lie that, that people who are often suicidal believe, well, my family would just be better off without me. Well, let me just say, that is so not true. I'm, I've been on the other side. You just take your pain and you put it on the people you love and you leave it with them. And so, you know, here now I was a single parent of a four-year-old. I was not working. I was a stay-at-home mom. And so it was a very scary time. 
And I sense the Lord saying, okay, Natalie, you said it to your church. Are you going to live it? Do you, you know, do you believe I'm still on the throne? Do you still believe I'm a good God? And are you going to trust me? And I wish I could say that I did that perfectly. I didn't. It was a struggle. There were some days that were better than others. There was a lot of tears, a lot of yelling, a lot of uh, just crying out to God. But I want to say our God is a good God and He's a healer. And I'm so thankful for Him. And never would I in my wildest dreams thought I would be standing here tonight sharing my story, much less teaching counseling and psychology. But because of what I've been through, if God can use my hurts to help others, then Michael didn't die in vain. And so, and I'm so blessed to say that that's not the end of my story. That's a part of my story. Because seven years after Michael died, God brought this man, Jeff, into my life, who is a rock star. <laughs> and I just thank God for him. He has been a huge blessing. And even in our own marriage, we've been touched by suicide because just a few years ago, we lost his mom to suicide from a prescription drug. She has a pres prescription drug addiction, and she overdosed. And so this is real. This is so real. And so I just want to share with you, first of all, if you've lost somebody and you're struggling, we have a group that meets once a month at the Bridge Church down the road. And if you want more information, I'm happy to tell you, but it's for anyone 18 or older who has lost someone to suicide. And it's just to talk to other people who've experienced a similar loss. Because it's different than any other kind of loss because you feel guilt, you feel shame, you go through your head, what ifs, what did I miss? There's a million questions. And so I want to share that with you. But also, if you're struggling yourself, tell somebody. Don't suffer in isolation. That's probably one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't talk about it to the people I loved. And so I encourage you, share with somebody. There is help. If you're a student at Truett, we have a partnership with a community counseling center that you can go and get free counseling. Truett will pay for it to get you help. All you have to do is let me know, let Jonathan Morris know, somebody will hook it up. We don't need to know what you talk about with your counselor. We'll just need to know your goal, you know, hook you up and go. But that, that's available to you guys. Talk to each other. You don't have to suffer alone. All right, so our first question is, how can we properly diffuse this situation when someone is about to complete suicide? I would just sit be there for them. Just don't let them, I, we talked about isolation, don't let them isolate themselves because that's where it's more liable to happen. Um, and just remind them of like who they are and just remind them why they mean so much to you and just to the people. Because the biggest lie that I continue to believe is that nobody cared about me, that my family didn't care about me, my friends didn't care about me. And that is so untrue because here's the thing, y'all. I want y'all to remember this too. Somebody's looking at you every day. They may not tell you. And it's not like that, oh, I'm staring at you kind of thing. It's like... <laughs> It's someone's looking at you, looking at the way you act, looking at the way you speak to one another, care for one another, love somebody else. And they may never verbalize that to you, but that may be somebody who sits at the, like, up at the cafe, they sit alone, but they're seeing how kind you are. And maybe that's giving them hope. Go reach out to those people. And don't let anybody sit alone. Like I will be the first one to be like, hey, I don't know you, but hey, I'm going to sit with you because that's, <laughs> that you've got to love people where they're at. And if that's where they're at, then they know someone cares. Someone loves them enough to come care for them. So. And I would add to that, don't be afraid to ask the hard questions. Ask them. If you know they're really depressed and they're down, have you thought about hurting yourself? And they may be relieved that somebody has asked them and given them a chance. But then stay calm. If they, um, if they do, uh, if they say, yeah, I've had thoughts of it, but I'm not really going to do anything, then you may want to point them to counseling. But if they're like got a plan and they're ready to act, you want to get them help immediately. Um, on your tables are the Georgia, Georgia Crisis Hotline. This is the uh, Georgia Crisis Access Line. And you can call this number and they will um, have a licensed counselor on the phone with you. And if need be, they will send a counselor to wherever you are in person to talk with them. There is also an app you can download on your phone called GCAL. My G, it's called My GCAL. You can download the app. And then another app that I really like is called Not OK. And this was created by two teenagers in Georgia. And basically, I encourage every one of you to do this. I've got my master's students. I'm always telling them to put this on their phone. It's an app where you go in and you pre-program. If something were to happen and you were in a really bad place, who are people that you would want to reach out to you? Who are the people that love you and support you? And you pre-program their phone numbers in it. 
And so if at any time you're not okay, you press that app and it sends a message to Kyle saying, Kyle, Dr. Ford's not okay, you should check on her. And it lets him know, hey, something's going on. And so that's another great tool that's out there. Um, if you're on campus and you need you know, support, come find me, come find Dr. Fowler. We're here, we wanna help you guys. Uh, but the big thing is just don't leave the person alone. Let them know that you are willing to walk through it with them. If they're going to counseling, be willing to go with them the first time. It can be scary the first time you go to counseling. I've been. Um, but just being there, I think, is the greatest thing you can do. So great question. Let's take the next one. Ooh, this is wordy. I like it. <clears throat> I'm so afraid that I will lose a family member to suicide, but I don't know how to help, and I already feel a lot of guilt. Do you have any ideas for how to deal with that? That's a hard one. Um, again, I think if you know somebody in your family is struggling, um, letting them know how much you care, having a candid conversation about it, um, letting them know there are resources out there. I mean, depression is the, no, is the second, no, excuse me, it's the number one disability in the world, but it is also the most treatable. And so, but to get help, you have to be willing to tell somebody. So if they're not coming to you, go to them, you know, tell your family member. And if you're here at school and you're not at home, make sure somebody at home knows your family member is struggling and can check in with them. Help them connect with other people who love them and care about them. If you're in church, you know, bring, let your pastor or someone know that can be involved. Um, and let them know how much you need them, all right? Because they, again, that lie creeps in, oh, you'd be better off without me. And that's just not true. And so letting them know. Um, I had a, uh, someone call me just this uh, past week, and they actually it was through Messenger, and said they were giving me a goodbye letter and said, I'm about to take my life, and I want you to promise to take care of my family. And I said, no. I've got my own family to care for. That's your responsibility. Now, that might sound cold, but if I said, sure, I'll take care of your family, I just gave him permission to end it. But by me saying, no, that's your responsibility, he's still got something to be here for. He's still got a purpose to provide for his family. And praise God, he's still here right now. And so letting them know that they're needed, I think, is very important. Um, kind of bouncing off that with uh, some of the things that uh, were said in that fear and guilt. Um, fear, don't let that fear take you captive and prevent you from not saying anything or not reaching out because consistency is one thing I implore you guys. It's, this is an everyday kind of thing, an everyday kind of love. So don't just check up on them. It's like, oh, I'll check up on them on Thursday and then I'll come in next Thursday. Don't make it weekly. Make it a daily thing that just pour into them, love on them. Even if you're like, like you said, if it's at home, call them, text them, make sure they're okay, pour into them. Because don't let that fear and that guilt hold you captive because fear and guilt are tools the enemy uses to create distance and a gap. Don't let that gap be there. You bridge that gap. But then at the same time, also understanding that they're their own person and, and if something should happen, it's not your, it's not your fault. Um, this is a great question. If a student from Truett went to counseling, would their parents be notified? If you are over 18, then you have to resign a release of information for things for your counselor to share with your parents. So it is up to you whether or not you sign that release of information and your parents are notified. So if you're over 18 and you don't want them notified, that, that's your prerogative. So Now if you file it on insurance, they may know, but through Truett. This is a really good one. Are some people meant to hurt? I always feel so lonely knowing uh, nothing lasts forever. Nothing ever lasts forever. So, you can take that one. I was about to say, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. No, but like, no, I'll, 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 I'm joking, but... Um, <laughs> That is, that is hard. Um, hurt is not something we're exonerated from. We're ne there's nothing in the Bible that says, oh, there's, there's no suffering, there's no hurt. We're supposed to live perfect lives. Like, no, like hurt, hurt is part of how we grow. Um, and that's part of the reason not only me and Dr. Ford are standing here, but many of you are sitting here right now is because something that was a very painful in your life, although, albeit very painful, made you who you are today. And it was like very helpful towards that. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say people are meant to hurt, but I would say that we're not exonerated from hurting, but don't let hurt drag you deeper into that pit. Hurt is going to happen, but it's how you, like your resiliency from that hurt, how you get back up is how that forms your character, but also 
gives you that platform to say, like, I beat this. I overcame this, not by myself, but by the Lord taking me through that season of my life and preparing me for the next one. Um, and the nothing lasts forever aspect of the question, that's, that's hard, but it is, it's very real because, I mean, time changes very quickly. But the thing is, we're, no matter where we go, because many of us in this room, some of us will go to South America, some of us will end up staying in Georgia, but at the end of the day, we're all united by that bond that I talked about earlier, and that's that brother and sisterhood in Christ that we have. <coughs> and so the power of prayer, because, I, I'm, guys, the power of prayer cannot be under, undervalued here. Patience in that is key, but the prayer, obviously you've seen it move mountains, and that will never come back void because he always answers. And, and I would just add that after Michael died, I didn't think I would ever smile again. As a matter of fact, when I look back at my old journal post, I was like, will I ever have a day that I don't cry? Will I ever laugh? And I thought that that was my new normal. I just, and I remember asking, Lord, did you create me to hurt? Because that feels like all I've done my adult life is hurt. And, um, and I'm on the other side of that. You now I still have struggles and I still have trials today. But I can say that God has given me incredible joy. And I've learned that my joy is not found in my circumstances, but it's found in Christ. Because before I went through this, I loved God because He did good things for me. You know, He gave me a family. He gave me a good job. He's let me be a missionary. But after this, I learned if God never gave me another thing, He's given me Himself, which is the greatest gift. And I have joy in that, if in nothing else. And so I share that with you to share, even though right now may seem very dark and it may have seemed like a really long, dark period, <laughs> joy comes in the morning. Cry out to Him. Read the Psalms. I mean, they're full of despair, but then there's hope. And just cling to that hope that, that morning is going to come. So, how can I help my friend who is suicidal? I think we kind of answered that some before with the hotline numbers, not being afraid to ask them, just being present. I think we kind of talked to that. Yes. Um, when you've been in an abusive relationship, how do you let God handle it? That's a, That's a tough one. Um, realizing that it's not your fault. <coughs> I think that's the biggest thing. Like, Kind of touching on the last one, like, uh, are people meant to hurt? That... If you've been in an abusive relationship, whether that be verbal, whether that be physical, that's not your fault. Like, that's, that's not something you're condemned to or handcuffed by. That's not something you're chained to. Because uh, you don't belong to that person. You belong to God. You're a creation of God. And so is that person, too. So just, I would say, that's, that's, what, that's what I would say to that. I would say just that it doesn't define your worth. It never will. Yeah. I would agree with that, and I would say, you know, come talk to me outside of this session and let's have a conversation about that. Um, how do you deal with regret when you feel like you're the reason they ended it? That's, a, that's another hard thing, and I will say that's a common feeling for those of us who have lost someone to suicide. Um, I can't tell you how many nights I would replay over and over um, everything that we went through with Michael, and, and yeah, I missed a lot of stuff but I didn't know it at the time. In hindsight, we always see. How do you live with that regret? I think um, they ultimately made that decision. And so you did not actually pull the trigger. You weren't there. You know, you didn't, you're not to blame. But what do you do with that regret? I think you give it to Jesus, and you just are honest about it. And you get professional counseling. And you get help. Yeah, or come to, a, come to a support group. I can't tell you. I mean, it's been years ago that I lost my husband, but I still go to these groups, one, to give back to others, but two, it just takes me deeper in my own healing. And so it's a great, great ministry. Uh, touching on that, like uh, just the regret part of it, like when Mark, when Mark took his own life, I was I, I, six months of just going back and forth, like, why did it happen? Could I have done more? And then I was just like, I, if I did do more, and then I finally had gotten to a point where I was like, even if I did, like I can't, I can't hold myself responsible for that because that's going to prevent me from being that. Like I would have stonewalled people the next time somebody comes to me dealing with that. I'd be like, no, that fear would have caused me to stonewall them and possibly send them further, and I was not going to let that happen anymore. And so, <coughs> next question: How do I know I can trust the person I tell? Um, first and foremost, I would say go to someone that you know 
loves you and that cares about you and that you can go to is like, hey, please keep this confidential. Like, and here's, a, here's another thing. Don't let your fear of vulnerability prevent you from telling that person. And that's what kind of kept me in isolation. It's just like, I didn't want to tell anybody because it was like, I want to seem like I'm, I'm all right and I can have it together, kind of like you were saying. Um, but being vulnerable is the first step to growth, y'all. Like just not, I mean, bearing one another's burdens. We're called to that in what, Galatians 6, I believe. And so we're supposed to carry one another's burdens, be there for one another. So go to somebody you know you can trust. And when you, I guess, to answer the question, to like to how you can tell you can know you can trust them is just your, your gut instinct, your heart. Because if you go to them in a place of vulnerability, it's like, I don't need you to tell anybody about this, but I'm asking you to just help me and love me and just help me through this. I'm sure they'll understand. Just don't don't let fear be that barrier. It's like, how can I know I can trust them? Just trust trust God, but also trust them. And if you don't know who that is, come to one of us you've seen up here tonight. We're happy to talk. Um, this next question is, how do I tell my parents I'm having suicidal thoughts? Um, first, I want to say, if, if that's you tonight, I want to encourage you before you leave, either to write your name down and slip it to me or just come to me and say, hey, that was me, because I'd love to talk to you more later about that. Um, but I think it just starts with a candid conversation with mom, dad, I'm really struggling. I'm really hurting and I don't, I need help. I can't do this by myself. And I think that's where it begins. I think I need to talk to somebody. And, um, and then from there, if you want to say, you know, I've, I've really had thoughts of hurting myself and it scares me. And I'm telling you because, because I want you to help me with this. And uh, as a parent, I can promise you, if my daughter came to me with that, I would do everything within my power to get her that help. And so, but I do ask if that's you tonight to please let me know whether you write me or if you can't come to me tonight, shoot me an email at nford at truit.edu and let me know. I'd love to talk to you later about that. Don't let, again, like I just answered the last question, don't let that barrier, because your parents look at you, obviously, as precious. You're their child. They look at you with everything in the world. And so don't, because they're, they're not going to treat you any differently. They're your parents. They love you. They want you to come to them and be vulnerable. They'll be so glad you did. Mm-hmm. I love this question. Do you know of any hopeful stories of people who were suicidal and got help through a local church? Believe it or not, yes. <laughs> um, there are, uh, unfortunately, again, it's a subject a lot of churches don't talk about, and a lot of pastors aren't trained in it, but I think the pastor's heart is to want to help in most situations. Um, but I think there are a lot of times that people do go to the local church and they find support or find a referral to a, a Christian counselor. Um, I know not for the suicidality, but after Michael's death, the, the church were the hands and feet of Jesus in my life. I would, not have, I would not be where I am today if I had not had the church walking beside me. They loved me. They did not judge me. They did not shame me. They just loved me in my pain. And, uh, and I've heard of countless stories of people who um, have been suicidal and they have found healing in the church. So, yes, I do think that's possible. Just a straw poll. How many of you go to a church uh, in the area on Sundays? Raise your hand. Okay, so you guys are the local church. You guys are the church back here. And so, like I said when I was uh, talking up here a little while ago, I, I didn't open this up to anyone until about two years ago. No one knew. My parents didn't know I struggled with that or even attempted. I covered it up. And it was people like Lacey. It was people like Katie. It was people like Austin and Jay that were the hands and feet, that were the local body, that loved me where I was for the first time in my life. I never got that in middle school. I never got that in high school, but I got it here. And that gave me, it's like, I can be vulnerable. I can be myself with those people. And I can be open with the struggles that I face because maybe that is something that I can open and it can help someone else. And so you guys are the local church and you guys can do that and you guys can open up and be that in the hands and feet. So, yeah. Yeah. And I just, I want to thank Kyle for being vulnerable and sharing his story because I know that there are a lot of other people in this room with similar stories and it takes a lot of courage. But if you know Kyle, I mean, he's one of the most joyful people I've ever met. And so to know that he has struggled, to me it gives hope because when you're there, you think you're the only person on the planet that's ever been there. 